an hour and a half away from Nairobi. We're actually right over South Sudan now, coming up over Juba, and we've just hit some turbulence. Oh. Months after a handwritten essay arrives out of the blue, we're finally on our way to meet its mysterious author. Uh, so it's about three in the morning and I'm at the airport. After years of investigating his cousin's death, this is a big moment for Jeremy. He might finally get some answers. I feel like this has to happen. Right now the reality of doing this piece of work is uh, dawning on me. The essay writer has promised over and over that when we meet in person, he'll tell us what happened to Chris. It feels like we might be heading for some answers, but I got an email from Joyce a couple of nights ago, um, and there's one line in particular which has definitely stayed in my head, because at the end of the email she says, I know you leave momentarily for Nairobi. She says, we're aware that the conversations you will have may be most significant in determining what happened to Chris and why. Know that we travel with you. It's a reminder at 30,000 feet in the air that Chris's parents are also waiting for us to bring them the truth. What we discover in Kenya could transform what we know about Chris and how he died. It could deliver his parents peace or shatter them all over again. It could turbocharge their campaign for justice or maybe it could destroy it. I want to know what really happened. They need to know the truth. Who is responsible? Was Chris killed in crossfire? Was he targeted? These are the questions I have. I'm Basha Cummings. From Tortoise, this is Pig Iron. Episode 5, Kaya. Jeremy and I meet at our hotel in the centre of Nairobi. I had a bit of a, like, moment of freak out on the... I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> but not just in terms of coming here, like, the whole thing. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Relating to what exactly? Like, doing this podcast? Doing this podcast, like, all the stuff around Chris, like, maybe there's a reason that nothing's happened, but... That's good. I mean, that's yeah. a good. That's a good feeling. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I've I've had that many times. I just I was questioning everything, just as I was like rushing to the flight. <laughs> Maybe it was because I was feeling nervous about yeah. going to Kenya. I think that's but... normal. Yeah. And and also like, we're kind of past the point of no return now. Yeah, we were. We still don't really know who the essay writer is, but he's given us a list of names people he originally said that we could contact to check his identity. But just when we were about to make some calls, he changed his mind. His tone became colder. It spooked us. How can we know if he poses a danger, if we can't figure out who he is? And how can we trust anything he says? Because remember, if his claim is true, it changes the whole story. If Chris was captured alive by South Sudanese government soldiers and then killed when he refused to cooperate with them, that means a deliberate killing. He was wearing a jacket and the body was taken to Juba. So Jeremy has been doing some careful digging, his speciality. He's been reading back over the essay. Another USA journalist called Alan also his number is provided, visited me, and I talked to him a lot, especially about Christopher Allen. And among all the South Sudanese names, there's someone referred to as an American journalist. It's just one name, Allen. But Jeremy figures out who it is. It's someone we think it's safe to contact without putting the essay writer at risk. It turns out he's a former journalist who researched the South Sudanese civil war, and we get lucky. He is, by pure chance, in Nairobi at the same time as us. But what was your impression of him as a character? I think given that he was fairly senior at one point in the rebellion, given that it was basically a, a not far from his home area, not far from where he was, and given 
Chris's presence would have stood out. Whether he was actively trying to track Chris's movement or was passively receiving it, I'm not surprised if he would have known uh, about Chris's movement. So as such, do, do you think it's a good idea for me to meet him? Oh yeah, you can definitely meet. No, I don't, I don't think there's anything to be afraid with okay. from him. Yeah. The task of a journalist is always to sort fact from fiction, truth from rumour. But this is hard. We're up against years of memories fading and warping, of stories twisting into conspiracy theories. But Alan has put us at ease, at least in terms of our safety. And he's confirmed. This man is credible. The next day, we get news. The essay writer has arrived. We travel across town to another hotel and wait in the lobby. Here he is. Looks very smart as well. Jeremy looks trepidatious. Anxious, yeah. I, I think we're all feeling anxious. He's got a pink shirt and a blue tie, a pair of sunglasses and a green bag and he's coming in. So, we'll meet him. Okay. We shake hands, and he doesn't say much at first. Well, if you're ready, we'll, we'll go up into the room. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. Clutching a large notebook, he sits down in an alcove in the hotel room. In front of him is a small coffee table with two mics set up. He's on one side, Jeremy's on the other. Before we start, the essay writer carefully notes down our names. I'm sitting perched on a footstool in the other corner of the room, because this is Jeremy's moment. We'd written pages and pages of questions together, but we agreed that he would do these interviews, the culmination of his years-long journey. It felt right. My job is to listen and to watch and to see if I can figure out the riddle of what this guy knows. So when we spoke on the phone last, you told me that there's certain things that you can only say in person. I've got a whole lot of questions that I want to ask you. I want to find out who you are and how you came to have all this information. And, but I guess before we start doing that, do you want to tell me why you've come here? Yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's uh... As you are quite aware, my coming here is for a purpose. If it was not because of uh, Christopher Allen, I would have not even dared to come here. I want to be part of uh, the persons contributing towards the justice for him. He starts by telling us about who he is, how he lost both his parents in the Civil War in the 1980s and how he became a child soldier. At one point, he opens his shirt to show a large bullet scar. He tells us how he was drawn back into the war when it reached Equatoria, where the town of Kaya is, and where Chris was killed. I, I, I was so determined to at least find out how to get a solution to this kind of killings in our country, South Sudan. So, so there's an element of you which really wants to kind of have some sort of justice which is connected to seeing the government yeah. do the right thing. Yes. There's a steeliness to him, but he's warming up. From my corner, I sketch out the possibilities of what's going on here. He could be about to confirm that Chris was captured alive by the South Sudanese military, a detail that could totally rewrite our understanding of what happened. And maybe in that worn-out notebook, he has the evidence. Or he's just lying. He's used the promise of an answer as bait to get Jeremy in the room. But why? Jerry, I, I decided to enter that as a competition, knowing very well that I was not supposed to taking my age and the, what the conditions for the essay were. But I just felt that let me enter the essay and pass my message. So I, I felt that by entering that essay, my message would reach. And if I told you people are serious, or people are serious, I will be followed up. And then after that, I will be able to, to give what I have in mind. That the fact is, uh, Chris Allen was killed 
after being captured and they I think that one is a fact. Did, did you make Chris? Uh, personally, uh, I did not uh, meet him, but I heard of him from very many colleagues. So those guys, they, they told me how they came through with Chris. I did not meet him personally. Okay. We establish he worked in intelligence for the rebels and had networks of informers feeding him information. He makes it sound like many people knew that Chris was there, that it was no secret. So it wouldn't be a stretch to think that the government also knew he was there. So they were the really people on He describes the rumors he's heard through his web of local spies. So he told me that brief story that at first Chris had supplied some of those, I don't know whether he was linking up or whatsoever uh, to the government, but after failing to pay him, then uh, he switched. Instead of going, then he ended with the, with the rebels. So I was very interested in that information. So We'd heard this story before, or maybe variations of it. Some people had said that Chris was supplying the rebels with ammunition or providing logistics. Now we're hearing that he was supplying the government, the other side. Me, yeah, I thought maybe the government now knew about that, and that was why they decided that. That was now what was ringing in my mind. For a moment, I wonder if this could be some link to the mercenaries, to Craig Lang and their trip. But in all of our reporting so far, we'd found no evidence that Chris was providing active military help to either side. Nothing in all the emails and texts of Chris's that we'd seen. I was looking at an opportunity to still confirm this, to find whether it, it is really true. Did you? Uh, now there was nobody to, to inquire. Then the essay writer says something that sets Jeremy on edge. What do you mean? I mean there was nobody to give me the correct, because I heard from that friend, and I was not sure I wanted to, to find somebody, at least like your, your team, if I, I will get another time after this. It's very likely this is the last time we'll meet. I have to be honest. Okay. You know, I, I don't live in East Africa. It's very complicated for us to get know, here and for you to get here. So it's really sort of down to, to information sharing at this moment, I think. He suggests that this could just be the beginning. He says maybe if Jeremy could provide the money, he could dig further. It's like he's offering his services as a private investigator. But this is not the relationship Jeremy wants. This is the end of a long road, not the start of a new one. I think um, everything contained in the essay, the bit that was most um, upsetting and disturbing for us to read was the claim about um, what ultimately happened to Chris. After nearly wrote, two um, hours, we reach the key claim in the essay, the most important for me as a reporter, the most painful for Jeremy and his family. Mm -hmm. That a white man was captured and that he had photographs in support of the rebels. Next, you said, after 10 to 15 minutes, he, the lieutenant, called and said that the white man was dead for refusing to hand over his camera and failing to respond to questions of investigations. You can see why it's upsetting, I suppose. Yeah. Who are you saying killed Chris? Uh, what I know, because uh, for us in the army, regardless of who killed, but the person who is responsible, that was uh, Ani, Isaac Ani. So Isaac Ani was uh, a second LT, a second lieutenant in charge of MI, military intelligence. And then there was uh, another one called this uh, Samuel Taban. Samuel Taban was a captain of uh, national security services. He's naming specific people, and it feels like this is it. So those two guys in any operation in the army, whenever a person is captured for us, that person is handed over <clears throat> to these two categories, more so to the, the, the one of MI. That is it. 
uh, for that case, he was called uh, Isaac Ani. So, can you tell me what you mean by handed over? Uh, okay, uh, in a, a war situation, anyone can be uh, captured alive. And then, after being captured alive, has to be taken to MI for investigation. And then the soldiers can continue with their fighting. That's what will happen. Slowly, it's becoming clear that he's describing a typical scenario in which the two men he mentions would be responsible if someone was captured. But he's not saying it specifically about Chris or that day in Kaya. The only thing that is definitive is he says he learned about Chris being killed over the military radio. He heard that there was a white man with the rebels. Then he heard that the white man was dead. And the deeper we go, the clearer it becomes that everything he's telling us is second or third hand. Have you ever spoken to anybody who had seen and said who actually killed him if he was captured? You didn't speak to Anne personally. Did you speak to anyone else who actually saw it? Yeah, from military intelligence or SPLA. Have you ever spoken to anyone who says, yes, I shot him or yes, I saw it happen? No, I, I, I did not speak to any, but I heard from what Anne said. Anne talked. Jeremy is getting frustrated. The kaleidoscope is spinning and we've lost any sense of the picture inside. Um, I don't feel... Like, I'm a whole lot closer to really knowing actually what happened, having spoken to you. And <clears throat> I don't know how to tell whether or not you're telling your truth, the truth. You know, you seem to me like a really nice guy who believes what you're saying. But I, and as you speak, I can kind of imagine it. I can believe it. And I don't know if there's a bit of me which is hoping that it's true because it seems somehow more meaningful, a more meaningful death rather than just being caught in the crossfire. I don't know if it even matters. You, what you've heard is stuff that you've heard from other people, basically. Um, I don't think that you've said anything particularly different than what we discussed on the phone. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if in some ways we're asking the wrong questions and maybe in in a, in a complicated war zone like South Sudan, we're not going to find out actually what happened. And that's actually a really difficult thing to imagine, but also maybe the only way for us to find some level of peace with all of this. Um, uh, like I started before, what I wanted you to know, or the family to know, is the truth about how he, he died. And the situation is exactly what I've told you. Jeremy is done. He looks exhausted. So we swap places and I sit down in the chair. I've been listening and taking notes, but I decide I'm not going to ask him for any more details. I don't think he knows anything more than he's already told us. L like it is said, there are many shades to the truth. But it's hard to understand it. Unless you are out there. And those shades could be the, the, the other rumours that are coming up. Did you ever think when you were writing the essay that it might be painful for the family to read, that it might cause them pain, the mother or the father? Did you think that they would read it? Uh, actually, for us in, in our, our county, death is always so painful, but one cannot keep quiet. And that situation, I, I was quite aware, even when I was writing, sometimes I could pause because of how I was feeling that time. So I knew that it was going to be so painful, but there is no way that I can keep quiet about it. Truth is always painful, and it is hard to understand. Do you think we will understand? 
in the end? Or do you think the truth is going to be there's too many shades in South Sudan? Uh, I think there is no no any other way unless a mechanism is designed that we have this these guys I mentioned their names to come and state they are part of this because these are the real people who can tell us what happened. There's no way they can deny. We've gone as far as we can. The room feels suffocating, like we've been holding our breath for hours and suddenly we're gasping for air. Um, I don't know, it's made me kind of feel angry. Really? <laughs> yeah. At him? Yeah, kind of. I just don't... I don't buy it. I still feel like he has woven together a narrative that he thought could better his circumstances. Do you think he was quite upfront about that, saying, you know, I don't know that for sure, I haven't investigated it? South Sudan is interesting in that sometimes sometimes rumours have have truth. For years, Jeremy's had hints and promises, and once again, it's all turned out to be based on rumour and second-hand knowledge. But I have the benefit of distance. Of course, that's the luxury of being a reporter. You're on the outside looking in. I guess you could say that this is my day trip into someone else's nightmare. And from where I'm sitting, I think that we've arrived somewhere else after this interview. Because there's a saying, and it might be a bit of a cliche, but I'm going to use it anyway. The first casualty of war is truth. And as we packed up our kit, I thought, this man, this essay writer is the embodiment of that phrase, its voice, one full of rumour and misinformation warped over years by the forces of a war that killed his parents, engulfed his life and scarred his body. The next morning we meet our fixer, Her name is Halima Atumani, and she's an award-winning journalist from Uganda. She brings with her good news and a contagious laugh. (laughs) Weeks before we left, Jeremy was speaking to another man, an eyewitness to Chris's death. And he too is now on his way to meet us. It's a relief. This is a man we know saw the whole day unfold in Kaya. But that's not all. Halima tells us that while most of her conversations with the eyewitness have been about flights and buses and visas, she's been basically something of a travel agent for him. Among all that, he's been telling her things, things he's never mentioned to Jeremy. I don't remember his exact words when he goes, what would you advise me? Then I'm like, what do you mean, advise you on what? And then he says something that I felt, hmm, that kind of hit me. Then he goes, I wouldn't sell out Chris. I wouldn't what? I wouldn't sell out Chris. This is the first time anything like this has come up. Okay. And then I go, what do you mean you wouldn't sell out Chris? He's like, we were on a journey and he was killed. I wouldn't sell him out. I know who killed him and why. So I asked him, who killed him? Who killed Chris? And then he sends me this arrogant soldier response, cool down, I'll let you know when I meet you back in Kampala. And I'm thinking, okay. This is a very increasingly crazy journey, I guess. shut the curtains when it starts to block out some of the sound so it'll be a bit darker in here. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we might need to do that now and then I can, I can see how you're sounding. The next day, we meet at another anonymous hotel across the city. The problem is I have to be really careful what I tell you about this guy. I can't tell you what he looks like or what he was wearing. And I can't tell you much about his background. He now feels in danger because of what he knows. 
What I can say is that we did confirm that he was an eyewitness and that he was, I think, honest about what he remembers of that day. But because of his situation, I'm only going to focus on three things that he said and I'm going to weave it together with what we know about Chris's final reporting trip, built from interviews with South Sudanese journalists and experts whose own stories collided with Chris's that day in Kaya on the 26th of August, 2017. Having travelled from Ukraine to Uganda and north to the border with South Sudan, Chris entered the country at a particularly treacherous moment. Journalists are a target. Ten reporters have been killed since South Sudan was created in 2011, many more tortured and imprisoned. The president, a man called Salva Kiir, talks openly about the enemy within. So there was already a narrative about journalists and the West and it being against the government of South Sudan and looking for regime change. And the tools that they were using were already escalating. Just two months before Chris arrives, the government bans 20 foreign journalists from the country. One who had reported on the rebels just before Chris tells me it was very dangerous. When we pulled out, the base where we were staying was attacked. They're only there for two days. But Chris wants to do things differently. He's planning to stay for weeks. True to his ethos, which he told friends many times, he wants to get as close as possible to the story. But I think it's fair to say he doesn't really grasp the dynamic of this war. It's so far outside what he's experienced in Ukraine. This is not trench warfare. The rebels are a ragtag bunch, groups of young men mixed with some boys who look barely older than 12 years old, wearing worn-out camo. Others are just in hoodies. Nearly all of them carry AK-47 slung casually around their shoulders or across their bodies. They all have the blood-red band of the rebels tied across their heads. In preparation for his trip, Chris had messaged other journalists in the region to try and get a feel for the place. But that came with its own tensions. One reporter wrote later that she felt a desire to protect her turf when Chris first reached out. She provided some contacts, but she said she didn't volunteer any other information on how to navigate rebel-held South Sudan. A mistake, she says, that has been a great source of guilt. And Chris had his guard up too. He doesn't share his plans either. And his emails suggest that he doesn't pitch any stories on South Sudan in anticipation of his trip. He's going it totally alone. Chris arrives at the rebel HQ, and he's there for days, weeks, and he makes a real impression. The rebels like him. Uh, I came to visit SDLAIO. Oh yeah, I know. After SDLAIO. And so first I want to thank uh, IO for their hospitality and for welcoming At a rally at the rebel HQ, Chris is filmed making a speech in support of their fight. And I wonder if perhaps this video could have fueled the rumor that Chris was supplying logistics. But then, after days of waiting around, things start to move. From the rebel HQ, he travels with them to another village closer to the border. And there, two other journalists arrive. They're from Reuters, one of the biggest news agencies in the world. Which brings me to the first of three big moments in the lead up to his death an argument with a commander. The division commander has a question that journalists should remain behind with him. All of them, three of them, will remain behind. He tells Chris and the Reuters journalists to stay behind. And what did they think of that? No, they they, they, they all, three of them, they, 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 they refused. Mostly Chris. Mostly Chris? Yeah. And how did they refuse? Was there an argument? Yeah, Chris told the division commander that he came to cover and go with the army in front, not just to come after. All three of them are eventually allowed to cover the attack and report from the front line. And around 6 p.m., as the sun is setting, the rebels, with all three journalists in tow, embark on the long final hike in the direction of Kaya, about eight hours' walk away. 
photographs from Chris's camera show the rebels carrying equipment, including cameras. Chris is wearing an armband, a bright red strip of fabric, identifying him as with the rebels. And so are the Reuters journalists. They're all dressed casually. None of them are wearing any protective gear or anything big identifying them as press. In these conditions, it's just too heavy to wear, too cumbersome. And through the dark, wet night, eating just a few biscuits for fuel, they walk. The next day, it's early in the morning, just after 6 a.m. The air is dense, wet. It's been raining heavily overnight. As they near Kaya, the journalists split up and follow different groups. It's the setup chosen by the rebels, but it suits Chris too. He probably knows he needs to capture something different if he's going to sell it. He can't just do the same thing as Reuters. So Chris goes one way, the Reuters journalists go another. The attack on the town begins. Bullets fly through the air. Then the moment comes. Chris's group enters Kaya and closes in on the main road that runs right through the middle of it. Chris is running. He goes ahead to take a photograph and loses cover. He's exposed. We start shooting first. Then the the heavy machine that they have is firing on us. Machine gun? Yes. Because Chris was busy for snapping, he just made the turn to, to make a move forward. Then he was shot on the head. As the eyewitness speaks, I think back to Chris's journals from Ukraine and to three lines in particular. During one of his first trips to the front line, when he's just 23, he wonders about what death feels like. It's a moment I'm sure every war reporter contends with many times over. Will the end come quickly, he writes. Will I be conscious of the moment I pass from life to death? Will I realise it's coming, that I'm dying, that I'm dead? So when Chris, he fall three times, he was shoot again in the chest, the the other side of the lip. So automatically, he he died on the spot. I asked to clarify, a shot to the chest? There was no shot to the chest in the post-mortem. I say to him, are you sure? Do you mean neck? No. And the chest here? He looks confused. No, the chest. He was shot in the chest. But the, 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 the shooting in the head is the one who killed him. This moment sticks in my head, but we carry on. He's killed instantly, and others around him are shot too. This is an ambush. All around, rebel fighters are retreating. Chris is on the ground, but before they leave him behind, the rebels remove his bag, his jacket and his cameras. They say it's to send back to his parents. Then they run. So what I'm trying to say is they really mean and target to kill him, the government. How do you know that? Why I'm knowing this, first of all, this is not far. They shot him very short wave distance. And they knew this guy is a white man. And this guy, he don't have gun. And this guy is using camera. Again, the kaleidoscope starts spinning. At first, the eyewitness says that Chris was shot to the chest, but he wasn't. Now he's saying he was shot at close range, but the autopsy report says it was a long range shot. Even if they are not educated, they could know that this may be my be journalist. So, secondly, they remove his clothes. I'm seeing them in my naked eyes. They sing a lot of song, and also they remove the clothes. They mean to target him. So you're saying there was a celebration around Chris's yes, yes, body? Yes, around the body, yeah. Was it just around his body? They were celebrating, singing a song. Only around his body, or was it around also the bodies of other... The body, maybe the body can be in the middle, like now we are in the middle here. But just around here they are celebrating while the body is 
attack in the middle of them. The eyewitness says that the government soldiers celebrated around Chris's body. It tallies with those pictures that were taken, his body humiliated after his death. Within hours, Chris's body is recovered and transferred back to the capital, Juba, by plane. So we went, right? We went to the airport. Um, you know, a bunch of journalists, they wanted to film and see what's happening. And in Juba, rumours go into overdrive. WhatsApp groups of foreign correspondents and local reporters are buzzing to try and identify who has been killed. Hiba Morgan, a reporter for Al Jazeera, is asked to identify the body, but no one knows who it is. And I'm like, I, I wouldn't know the guy. I, I don't know anybody who's in Kai at this point. Then a press conference is called. It's led by South Sudan's Minister of Information, a man called Michael McWay. And he said, you know, you guys know the fate of Christopher Allen, so be careful. Something along those lines. Another journalist, Juma Peter, is there too. He says the information minister had a smile on his face as he talked, but it all felt like a threat. I understood from that press conference that nothing will happen, no investigation, nothing will happen. That he died and somebody is proudly announcing the death of somebody, that no accountability will actually take place. The information minister then goes on American radio and repeats the white rebel claim. The fight in suit, and in the fighting, 16 rebels, including a white rebel, were killed. The identity of that white man is not known. To the many South Sudanese journalists I've spoken to inside the country, this was not a surprise. For years, the government had been making it clear to them, if you interview the rebels, if you host them on your radio station, if you write about them, will treat you like a rebel. In Facebook groups and forums online, you can see this narrative at work. Under a news article about Chris's death, people post scathing attacks on him. One says, Chris Allen is an intruder and deserves to be torn into pieces. Another, you whites are behind all the messes in our country. Chris's body is held for a number of days at the military hospital in the capital. And then, at a moment which turns into a spectacle, it's given into the custody of the US embassy. Uh, where does this body belong to? Which was confirmed by American embassy. And based on that, we started the process. And the body... One reporter said that this was basically government propaganda. They said because he was a foreigner, the government needed to show the people that rebels were working with outside forces. That's why the body was displayed. I mean, there's, there's so many more things that we could try and verify by talking to other people. But what I'm saying is that every conversation that might come after now might be more of this, mm. that, that no one is going to, like everything is tiny bits that you piece together. How much further do you want to go? I suppose the thing that remains is asking someone, there are a number of people now who've been mentioned on the government side that are worth speaking to. And I suspect they won't want to speak, but if they did, that would probably be the last port of call. Even though I think probably some people could totally say what happened and what won't, I just don't think they will. But there's something I haven't told you. Before we left for Nairobi, I'd gotten a message, one that I'd been waiting for for days and days, compulsively checking my phone. It's from Craig Lang, the foreign fighter in Ukraine, the mercenary who'd been in South Sudan just a few weeks before Chris. It says, sorry for the late response. I can speak with you sometime if you still need me. And I do still need Craig Lang. Okay, shall I go for it? This series is reported and written by me, Basha Cummings. Additional investigation is by Jeremy Bliss. The producer is Gary Marshall. 
Additional reporting by Halima Atumani and Xavier Greenwood. Additional editing by David Taylor. Sound design is by Carla Patella. Original theme by Tom Kinsella. With thanks to Sharla Alfred, Brian Adeba, Hibba Morgan, Nyugoa Tutpur at Human Rights Watch and Agnes Kalamad at Amnesty International. The executive producer is Kerry Thomas. Pig Iron is a tortoise production. Thank you.